your experience a good one. We're going to start with Alexandra. Um, she's a student, a fourth year student from USC uh, who came to us from Dr. Max lab, who we know well, uh, having been our recent visiting speaker. She has an interest in cerebrovascular neurosurgery. Uh, and she chose a case of a dural AV fistula resection to present. Oh, and just one other thing before she gets started. Uh, we've changed things up a little bit this year. All of our sub eyes this year are going to be presenting cases that they observed during their time rather than their own research, um, sort of going back to the way we used to do things. thought it might be fun for them and interesting for us as well. So, Alexandra, thanks again for coming this month, and we look forward to your talk. Okay, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Is that sharing okay? Looks good. Okay. Um, so as Dr. Morgan Stern just introduced me, my name is Alexander Demetrio and I'm a fourth year medical student. And today I'll be talking about a case um, with Dr. Mako that was a dural arteriovenous fistula resection. All right. This patient was a 61-year-old male. He had a history of metastatic prostate cancer, hypertension, hypolipidemia, diabetes, obesity, and peripheral arterial disease. Uh, he had initially presented back in March of 2023. He was experiencing some left-sided pulsatile tinnitus that was associated with dizziness, and it was worse upon standing. And he was also reporting some right arm paresthesias at the time that seemed to be associated with um, by the movements of the hands, like typing. He underwent carotid Doppler ultrasound and the CTA of the neck, which had demonstrated left carotid artery stenosis. And he underwent uh, left carotid stenting at that time. And during that procedure, he was incidentally found to have a left-sided dural AV fistula. So before I talk more about the patient, I just want to go into some background about dural AV fistulas. So these are direct connections between arterial and venous flow, and they do not have an intervening capillary bed. The inflow is going to originate from dural branches of either the internal carotid, the external carotid, or vertebral arteries. And these lesions often will drain into venous sinuses with the most common location being the transverse sigmoid sinus junction. However, they may also exhibit retrograde flow into leptomeningeal um, cortical veins. So these lesions are generally considered to be idiopathic and acquired uh, lesions. However, they do have an association with a number of pathologic states, including trauma, prior neurosurgery, venous sinus thrombosis, and venous hypertension. And um, to go to the pathophysiology, the idea is that any of these conditions can lead to upregulation of proangiogenic factors like hypoxia and disciple factor one or VEGF, which is then going to promote um, the formation of these aberrant connections between arteries and veins. So dural AD fistulas are most often diagnosed in patients who are about 40 to 50 years old, and there is a slight female predominance. Patients will typically present with pulsatile tinnitus being uh, one of the most common presenting symptoms. And as a clinician, you may also take this as a brewery. Um, patients, particularly with carotid cavernous fistulas, can also present with pulsatile proptosis. And then they may present with vocal deficits or seizures. Um, a number of patients do present just with hemorrhage as their first sign without any other symptoms. But at the same time, many patients will remain asymptomatic and these lesions may just be identified uh, incidentally. All right, so there are a number of different imaging findings that can be associated with dural AV fistulas. Just to walk through a few common imaging modalities, starting with the CT, this is going to be a less sensitive modality for these lesions. However, it is useful to demonstrate hemorrhage or edema that can occur secondary to venous hypertension. MRI is going to give you more information. Um, so just to go through a couple key sequences, on a T1 post-contrast image, that's useful for identifying venous ectasia or sinus thrombosis. Um, a T2 image can show you flow voids that are um, suggestive of, art, of fast arterial flow through um, large draining veins. Uh, gradient echo sequences can be useful for identifying microhemorrhages. And then uh, flare sequences are going to show you hyperintensities that are associated with edema secondary to venous hypertension. And finally, we have angiography, which is going to be your gold standard and necessary for making this diagnosis. That's where you're going to see early venous shunting from the arterial circulation. And it's very important to do um, internal carotid, external carotid, and vertebral artery and geography on both sides to make sure that you get a complete picture of the patient's vasculature in these cases. 
Um, and here on the images, I just have a couple examples. So the image A would be a T2 MRI, and this is demonstrating near the right transverse sinus, a collection of flow voids that corresponds to, to this lesion over here. Um, and then in C, we have um, an MRI demonstrating venous ectasia that corresponds to this lesion on angiography. So there are a couple of key classification systems for describing dural AV fistulas. The Borden and Conyard classifications are uh, the most commonly used. And um, here, the key feature is going to be the presence of cortical venous drainage that really helps stratify the risk of these lesions. Um, so a type 1 Borden lesion is going to have anterograde flow into a dural venous sinus or a meningeal vein, and this is generally going to be considered a benign low-grade lesion. Um, type 2 and 3 are both higher grade, and with that comes a risk of intracranial hypertension and hemorrhage. Type 2 is going to have anterograde flow into a dural venous sinus plus the presence of cortical um, retrograde venous drainage, and then a type 3 only has retrograde flow into cortical veins. Uh, the Conier classification has some similar criteria. So for this classification system, types 1 and 2A are both low-grade types of lesions, and then beyond that, the rest are considered high-grade. So type 1 will have anterograde flow into a dural sinus, and type 2A will have sinus drainage with retrograde flow within that sinus. Um, getting to 2B, your high-grade lesions, that's where we start to see retrograde flow into cortical veins. Uh, 2A plus B is just a combination of the previous two, essentially. Types three and four will distinguish between um, cortical venous drainage that either does not or does have venous ectasia. And then a type five is going to have drainage into spinal perimedullary veins. Um, so for dural AV fistula prognostication, um, so the key feature that increases the risk of hemorrhage is going to be retrograde leptomeningeal drainage. And additionally, these lesions may be associated with aneurysms or varices that can also increase the risk of hemorrhage. Um, for patients who do not have cortical drainage, it's appropriate to monitor them. However, if patients present with cortical drainage, uh, hemorrhage, orbital venous congestion, or neurodeficits, or just disruptive symptoms that are impairing their life, those are all reasons to proceed with treatment. There are a number of different treatment strategies for dural AV fistulas. Um, first, I'll talk about endovascular embolization. So there's an increasing um, shift toward moving toward using endovascular embolization as a first line approach. Um, this can involve including either arterial, uh, it can involve either an arterial or venous approach. Um, and the goal is to occlude the proximal segment of the draining vein where shunting occurs. And oftentimes um, a liquid embolic agent is used to do this. Um, this method is minimally invasive and it avoids the risk of surgical blood loss. However, there may be a disadvantage if there's potential migration of embolic material or difficulty reaching a lesion. Um, open surgery is another option for treatment. So this would be preferred if an endovascular approach may not be feasible for reasons that I mentioned before, such as difficult catheter positioning um, or small vessel caliber, and then um, a risk of embolization of nearby branches. Um, there are also a couple of key locations that tend to be treated with open surgery, such as um, dural AVFs that are fed by ethmoidal or ophthalmic arteries, as well as tentorial dural AVFs. These are generally speaking more easily approached with an open procedure. Um, and finally, there is the option for radio surgery. Overall, this is a less commonly uh, used approach than endovascular or surgical management. Sometimes it's used as a follow-up if one of the previous strategies um, was not effective. And some uh, clinicians will describe this as a first-line treatment for a less aggressive dural AV fistula, but it's not really appropriate for uh, lesions that have cortical drainage, hemorrhage, or progressive deficits. All right, so to go back to our patient, so um, uh, some time did go by between his previous or his initial diagnosis and his follow-up due to um, him needing cancer treatment. So he came back for a diagnostic cerebral angiogram in April of 2024. And um, at this time, there was re-demonstration of his left-sided dural AV fistula. You can see here in this image, it's fed by um, a left occipital artery branch, and it has cortical drainage um, toward the superior sagittal sinus. This is classified as a borden ponyard uh, type three lesion, and the plan was for surgical resection. All right, so the operative procedure involved a left parietal craniotomy for a dural AV fistula resection. Indocinine green dye was used during the procedure to visualize shunting, and um, the procedure involved cauterization of the feeding vessels and then repeat ICG to confirm that this fistula was ablated. All right, so here I have an intraoperative video. Um, you can see this early arterial filling of 
um, the vein here. This is an arterialized vein. And um, just to orient you, this is the vein of LeBay and the sigmoid sinus behind here. There we go. All right, and this is a video of the um, cauterization procedure. So this is the main um, fistulous connection that's getting cauterized and ultimately transected. And there were additionally a number of smaller arterial feeders that are not uh, visualized here, but those were also um, subsequently cauterized. Um, this is uh, ICG intraoperative imaging, just to confirm um, ablation of this fistulous connection that you can see here after it was ablated. And then here, there is no longer that fistulous connection um, and there's no early filling of the venous drainage. Postoperatively, the patient was taken to angiography um, and he underwent left uh, CCA angiography, which demonstrated successful treatment of the lesion. This is just a reference image from prior to treatment where you can see the fistula and then here um, with this postoperative angiography, there's no longer any filling of the fistula. So the patient did very well um, postoperatively. He recovered and was neurologically intact, and he was discharged on postoperative day two uh, with just a week of Keppra and dexamethasone with plans for outpatient follow-up. And I just want to thank Dr. Mako and the team for including me um, and uh, letting me be part of this case. It was very interesting to watch, and um, thank you to everyone for an excellent step by experience. Um, Alex, this was a great case and an excellent presentation. Thank you for uh, going through this. Um, I, I really like that you also showed the slide with the time result DSA pictures, uh, which really highlights the importance of those images in uh, the diagnosis and management of patients with curating fistula. A lot of times, this case that you you brought is is very uh, uh, very uh, followable. It's it's very understandable to see the connections there between the pitchless, uh connection between the artery and the vein. A lot of times as time passes on uh, with all of the VEGF and the angiogenesis that happens, the small fistula that starts with just a couple of vessels become a monstrous thing of uh, vessels in which it's very difficult to identify where the fistulous connection is, which is why endovascular options sometimes become difficult because uh, it may become difficult to see this point of fistulous connection and this, you know, the providers embolize targets that are not the true fistulas, but rather angiogenetic vessels that can result in big utilization of embolic material without actual cure, but rather making things more aggressive. So I think this really highlights the importance of correct identification of the fistulous point, because once that is, is approached, either surgically or in the vascularly, all of the other vessels are going to disappear. Uh, but that's a great case. Thank you for, show, for uh, sharing it with us. Yeah, it was very um, interesting and elegant to watch intraoperatively. Um, so yeah, it was great. I'm glad I was part of it. Alexandra, what, what could you imagine? I mean, you, you obviously saw a case that went smoothly, was, was uh, successful in obliterating the fish to level. What could you imagine could go wrong in one of these cases? Um, so I believe that these cases, the one of the main risks is intraoperative hemorrhage. These lesions can um, bleed quite significantly, and it's important as you're approaching the lesion to um, ensure control of bleeding at every step. That way um, you're not leading to a significant hemorrhage and that there's transfusion products available and things like that, especially for larger and more complex lesions. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think the other big thing that, that probably most of the vascular folks would attest to is that you can certainly misidentify the fistulous point, even in an open case. So making sure that you've, I think that you've used ICG, that you've appropriately identified that the point, um, sometimes you, maybe you even can't successfully obliterate it, but you do your best to find the, the correct point at which to obliterate the fistula so it doesn't come back. All right, well, thank you. Very nice presentation.